<laughs> Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to House of Togetherness. My name's Adam. I'm going to be introducing James tonight. I just have a show of hands who's been to the house before any of togetherness events. Put your hands up. Thanks. If you haven't been here before, just put your hands up. Great. Thanks so much for coming. We're a pop up dedicated to meaningful human connection. We're here till the 31st of October, and we want to open people up to new experiences of themselves. Togetherness is all about understanding more of ourselves so we can have a fuller and richer connection with ourselves, with other people in, in the world. And it's partly inspired by this kind of polarization, by this kind of black and white um, conflict that, that happens. And I've invited James to come and talk about psychedelics and connection. Um, for me, I first took psychedelics uh, when I was 15. Um, uh, I, was, I went to a kind of public um, boys' school and it really changed my understanding of, of the world and started me on a bit of a journey. So I think it's interesting um, as a way of helping people to see different understanding uh, different aspects, different ways of, of looking at things and understanding more of ourselves and knowing that actually it would just, we just, it's just a big mystery, you know, why we're here and what we actually are. No one can still really tell us that. Um, James is brilliant and um, I don't know if any of you saw him on when he was interviewed on Fox News about the um, decriminalization of mushrooms in, I think it's Oregon. Did anyone see that interview? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it, what, one of the things I like about James is he's so, he's so eloquent and he's so able to um, articulate uh, potential benefits. I feel very excited by some of the research that's going on at the moment into uh, depression uh, with uh, psychedelics at King's College. And I know that James is going to be absolutely fascinating. He's come all the way from Canada on a, on a mini tour. He's also going to be joining us at our summer festival in a couple of weeks' time in Dorset, so I do recommend you, you come to that. Without further ado, I'd like to invite you. You okay to be applauded on? Yeah, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so let's, let's give James a welcome. I'm going to use, I'm going to use this mic. Can't, do, is, this, is this doing anything? Is there any mic action happening right now? No, nothing? There's nothing from anyone. No one's saying anything. Here we go. Okay. Try that. How about now? Oh, great. You're live. Excellent. <laughs> I've never been in a situation where there's been a mic stand just pointed at me like this. It feels very official. Uh, and for those of you uh, who said that you didn't see me on Fox News, you might not have just known it was me because uh, I had my earrings out and my nose ring out and my hair back. And I was so nervous that pretty much it took every ounce of energy I had not to just completely lose it. And so I wasn't smiling at all either. I was just like, hello, <laughs> I am a serious person. Uh, <laughs> we are legitimate. Uh, so I don't really want to talk too much about um, the research or anything so much today, although that's kind of possibly there. because. My curiosities over the last little while, of course, has to do with the research. I run a podcast and I write and I sort of wonder about this kind of stuff for a living somehow. Uh, and the research is important and all of that, but my core consideration isn't necessarily like what can be achieved insofar as medicine or what can be achieved insofar as uh, discoveries in, into the nature of consciousness by being able to explore the the perturbation of consciousness through functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, my curiosity really primarily rests somewhere in the realm of this experience seems to be really meaningful. How do I live a life that's in alignment with the meaningful experiences that it offers? And what does it take to encourage experiences that bring about that type of meaning? And then what does it take to live that type of meaningful life and all the sort of uh, nuances that go with it? 
And that's kind of where I'm, where I'm focusing, I guess, right now today. And I must be nervous because my mouth is dry and cortisol makes your mouth really dry. So Adam mentioned to me that he wasn't sure what the familiarity of this group is insofar as psychedelics or psychedelic mushrooms in particular. Like I am filming this, but nobody is in frame. So I'm just curious, like you, by, by, a, by a show of hands, okay, how many of you have had psychedelics of any variety? Okay, now keep your hands up. How many of you have had psychedelics like, like a, several times? You feel pretty familiar with it. And if you don't, you can, you can put your hands down. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's a lot of you. All right, great. Thank you very much. You can all put your hands down as you've done. Okay. Uh, how many of you know about me before you've come here? So over the last few years, I've been running a podcast, and I have also I written I have had written I have written a couple of books here, and they were about uh, my journeys with psilocybin coming out of a depression and an existential crisis that uh, we'll say resulted from, but could have been a part of the larger arc of my experiences through fairly excessive and destructive drug use when I was in my early twenties. And working with psilocybin brought me into a different place in my life. And uh, since then, I've just kind of followed that trail to eventually coming and giving talks like this. And I was initially just going to give sort of a general overview about psilocybin in my work. And then when I was talking with Adam and he had mentioned something along the lines of psilocybin and connection, I thought that would be a pretty interesting one to explore, although I've never talked about it in a group before. And I'm really going to be leaning into the emerging group intelligence here. So I want you to hold uh, like a place inside of yourself that is wondering about what's happening and is wondering about what might be said or what could be said or what needs to be said or what you need to hear or what you're generally questioning about and be ready to you know, pop that up when the time is right. But when I asked myself about psilocybin and connection, I felt like, okay, there's other places I can go. There's like the neural, there's the, the neuroscience ends of things, the idea that when you, or the fact that when you take psilocybin, it changes the way blood flows in your brain and it takes away or reduces activity in a part of the brain that basically holds everything together in a structural flow, the default mode network, which is associated with uh, the ego, the subjective ego. And, um, as a consequence of that sort of redu reducing its own activity, then there's a cross communication throughout the brain, all of a sudden different parts of the brain that, that normally don't ever speak are all speaking all at once, they're all connecting, they're all sharing information all at once. Uh, so there's that side of things. And then there's the other side of things, which is that when that experience of the you know, ego dissolving away comes about, one of the things that happens is people think that they're dying. But another thing that happens is that the distinction between self and other starts to go away as well, as the ego in many ways functions to keep us as a as like, a, uh, like the, an operational sense of separate self that enables us to engage self and other in a particular way. And when that ego aspect starts to dissolve away, so does the normal distinctions between self and other. So the boundaries by which I define me and you start to flow away and then all of a sudden, it's no longer such a such an obvious divide. The 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 chasm that once separated us, once as uh, you know, isolated islands on a sea of meaningless uh, despair or, or 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 suffering and bliss and whatever it might be, now becomes uh, recognized as just a moment when the that the, that the land connects it. The land connects these islands, and the water washes away, and then we can become one. And there's that aspect as well. And then there's also the aspect that maybe brings us beyond even just the sense of being me and you with something else and a profound sense of connection that blends into nature, blends into time itself, blends into cycles of life, blends into potentially the very cycle of life as we know it from 14 billion years and we begin to feel intimately connected with all of the cosmos as a singular expression of life of which we are not only a part, but a full expression of as well. Paradoxically, the one and also the many. 
So those are all things that we could look at when we look at psilocybin and connection, but all of those things are curious for sure. But what I really started to wonder about is what, if we're going to talk about connecting, then it makes sense to talk about what holds us back from connecting, like what stops us from connecting. And there's a, there's a lot there clearly. And there's a few things that I wanted to get into today about that. And they include uh, looking at all of reality uh, as we experience as just models in our head. And I'm going to unpack that in a second. But also that the things that block us from connecting with others include unresolved pain, wounds, and trauma, um, as well as an inability to understand the value of connecting, usually as a consequence of that un unresolved wounds or heartbreak that we received early on, even if we never learned what love feels like because we never got it as a child or never really received it as a consequence of the, of the you know, social, economic, civilizational context in which we grew up, that uh, there's a part of us that knew that there was something we were supposed to get when we got here and we didn't get it. And uh, there's a heartbreak there, but then there's also just the, the total lack of having ever experienced that thing that at some point, at some part of us knew we were supposed to get. So there's a lack of knowing what it feels like. There's a lack of being able to feel it because we're too heavily um, sort of sheltered from our own pain and as a consequence like sheltered from anything that might invite us into feeling that pain and since chances are the vast majority of well the entirety of the emotional pain that we experience is situated in a relational context either presently or historically connecting requires us at some point to touch into those relational pain points which can be very difficult um, additionally there's that whole modeling thing also, if I drop some threads as I'm kind of just going off, just pick them up and hold on to them so that we can weave them back in afterwards. Okay, so those are the three. First, everything you know and everything you experience is just a model in your head. Now, that sounds maybe like an opportunity to go into this like solipsism kind of place, like, oh, I am the only being that exists, which may be true, that I might not necessarily be what I perceive as me, but maybe that's true, but that's not necessarily what I'm getting at. I do believe that there is some sort of something that is an external reality that exists. What I'm saying is not that it's not there, but that the way we experience it is a model that we have that we're sort of functionally using to very quickly perceive, interpret, and respond to the world, and that those models don't come from nowhere. They come from our experiences, especially in early life, but they also are infused and, and sort of co-created by the larger, by the vast multitude of concentric scales of relationships that we are woven into across time, including our culture and our society and our history and how that history is told and of course our early childhood. Um, now, have any of you heard of uh, attachment theory or attachment styles? Maybe put your hand up if you know attachment theory. It's great. Did it change your life when you learned about it? Oh my god. Um, so attachment theory is based off a premise, really based off this whole modeling concept and says that we have a working model inside of our head as to how to basically maintain love and what to prioritize in loving relationships and in our relationships in general. And uh, the three primarily, there's like, there's two categories and then the second category has two subcategories. Two categories are secure and insecure and the subcategories of insecure are avoidant or anxious and ambivalent. Excuse me. And uh, it's not sort of like a primary, like this is you, you're either secure or insecure, uh, but there's like, there's degrees of our life where we're more or less secure or more or less insecure. And these experiences are in many ways informed by our early childhood experiences, not only in the relational exchanges with our mother uh, and our father, but also how they interacted with each other and how they interacted with the world and how they, I mean, I'm, in the world, I mean the neighbors and like the other kids around and so on and so forth, but also in regards to how they interacted with their bills and with the cleaning, pretty much the entire first part of your life, you're just downloading the entire 
uh, reality that you live into the back of, end of your mind to later become what you perceive to be the world and your place within it, uh, even if it's true or not. But we have these early life experiences that inform our models and if we become more secure, that means that we kind of felt like our relationship with our parents was secure, the love was secure, that generally our mistakes or our mis misdeeds didn't put the relationship at stake. And so there are obviously parts of our lives where our mistakes didn't put our perceive, perceivably our relationships at stake as children, but there'll be other parts that did put it at stake. And by at stake, what I mean is that love would go away. And I have given lots of talks about how that, how parents accidentally and intentionally sometimes manipulate and weaponize their love, or they weaponize their love to manipulate their child's behavior from a place of A, not really knowing how to behave any better uh, because of how they were brought up or how society encourages them to operate, or B, not being able to behave any better because society plus their own upbringing has put them in a place of such stress and reactivity that are not able to respond with this sort of conscious intention towards maintaining the quality of the relationship and instead prioritize manipulating behavior to be more convenient for the parent's experience, which is not the best way to raise a child, um, but understandably so, because sometimes life can be hard. So um, if we're in a situation where the relationship's not at stake, in those areas we grow to be secure people. And as we become adults, if for the most part, most of the time, we got that type of loving connection with our parents will end up being more secure in the sense that we have secure relationship style. That means that generally we prioritize towards not, uh, intimacy, we prioritize towards non-naive trust, uh, we know how to take care of ourselves and soothe ourselves if we need to soothe ourselves, we know how to reach out to other people when we need other people, but none of it tends to be dysfunctional or, or explicitly reactive in any way. And we generally also know how to build larger circles of community support, social support and social connection in order main, to maintain the integrity of our lives. And maybe several of us are secure for the most part. Um, but chances are there are at least some places, if not a vast majority of our life where we are insecure because our childhood upbringing likely didn't bring us to a place where we could feel that the relationship was not at stake when we made mistakes because that's not how generally children are raised in our current society. And also society itself is fundamentally traumatic on a child because uh, it lacks some of the essential needs that a child has in order to develop into a well-balanced adult according to um, neurobiologists like Darsha Narvaez who suggests the very essence of a, of a two-parent system uh, is not functional for the child, let alone a two-parent system that puts those parents into excessive amounts of economic stress if they're ever to pay the bills where maybe they are two parents but they never care for the kids anyways and so they have a nanny or one parent's not there or they're fighting or because they can't pay the bills, blah, 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 this type of thing. Um, so chances are we, we likely have places in us where we're insecure. And the insecurity will take one of two forms, avoidant or anxious ambivalent. If you're avoidant, you've learned that the best way to stay safe in relationship is to move towards yourself and to prioritize your autonomy. So this looks like anytime we become distressed in relationship, we instead of moving towards intimacy, moving towards protecting ourselves with the, in a form of open communication, non-naive trust, uh, and getting the appropriate support we need, we just completely isolate ourselves to get away from the problem. Like, has anyone been in a situation where they're distressed as a consequence of being in a relationship and you're immediately like, well, I need to go drink, or I need to just get away from this completely. I need to listen to fucking trap music and think about how, whatever, I could just hook up with anyone I want, whatever. I don't even have to feel. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that would be like avoidant, avoidant type behavior. Additionally, avoidant people not only run away from their feelings, but have a tendency not to feel them at all. There's no, there's no conscious awareness that feelings are happening. And because they can't feel themselves, they don't know where their boundaries are. And because they don't know where their boundaries are, they're likely to say things like, oh yeah, I don't mind, I don't even care, I don't even think about it, it doesn't even matter until all of a sudden it matters a lot and they're freaking out and you don't know why they can't. They're not responding to calls or saying that they just need space or whatever it might be. So that would be like avoidant insecurity. Where an anxious, ambivalent people 
uh, oh, and, and also when people, avoidant people get that space, there is usually a feeling of relief in, the, in having gotten that space that is then uh, coupled with feelings of isolation that don't actually feel very good. But there isn't like, there's no capacity to actually move close towards love. There needs to be a pulling away in order to protect oneself, even though as pulling away just hurts even more, as would have been the case in childhood, because pulling away as a child to isolate yourself, to protect yourself from the pain of whatever the quality of dynamic is in your parental relationships certainly doesn't feel very good, but it's the better choice to protect yourself most of the time in that situation, at least as far as the child's nervous system is concerned, which might have ancient intelligence, but it doesn't have higher cognitive reasoning. So the anxious ambivalent people may tend to move towards, uh, or when they get distressed, they move towards closeness. They get anxious in the sense that, oh, if I feel like the relationship's at stake, I need to get even closer. And as they get closer, there isn't actually a resolution of stress or distress, because oftentimes people who are anxious and move closer, even if the partner, okay, so if the partner is avoidant, and even if the partner is secure, and the person is very anxious, an anxious person will push a secure person towards avoidant behaviors and avoid an avoidant person to like really avoidant behaviors. And so what ends up happening is a person will kind of like pull away initially. It's like, whoa, whoa, that's, you know, that's a bit much. And then that anxious person goes, oh, I knew it. The, relationships, the relationship is at stake. And even if they stay close and they allow that person to come in and they move towards closeness, that doesn't actually resolve the distress in an anxious, anxious person's mind, at least not immediately. And what ends up happening is that anxiety continues, continues to reinforce a very, um, a very uh, diligent, hyper-vigilant assessment of all the dynamics to notice things that are almost all totally 100% truly happening, but also reinforce the perception that all of that is saying that the relationship is still at stake and so they, they must move closer and eventually like the avoidant person will move far enough away or pretend like they don't have boundaries or whatever till they freak out the anxious person will ultimately freak out as well and all of these are these are behaviors that we engage in because they're the underlying models that dictate how we perceive and respond to stimuli in the world not because it's what's actually happening it sort of dictates our, you know, our behavioral responses, but also the sort of themes in our interpretations of what's happening and end up oftentimes generally recreating or encouraging uh, a, a, a living out in the relationship the very thing that was initially afraid of. So if an anxious person uh, is afraid that they will be abandoned and they have no ability to check that, then there's a good chance that they'll behave in a way that will push a person away from them and then they'll be able to tell themselves that it was true, they will be abandoned, and whatever sort of core model they have for their sense of self and their value in the world, such as I'm not good enough and I will, I will be abandoned, can be reinforced. Uh, and so for an avoidant person, they might go in being like, I'm, you know, this person's gonna be too clingy, I don't like when people get to try to like control me or blah, 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 because of course, we have to make concessions in relationships and sometimes that includes changes. And if you're a very avoidant person, a change, asking for a change kind of asks like trying to be controlled and you need autonomy. And so possibly it ends up being in a situation where that, that avoidant person continues to, avo continues to evade any request to change themselves in order to sustain the integrity of the relationship, ongoingly reinforcing their perception that in fact, they are trying, like they're being controlled and they'd, better, they'd be better off by themselves because nobody can really love them the way they need to be loved anyways. So you see how these, like, these are the relationship models uh, that we can carry around according to attachment theory. And we can also change that. Like we can move towards being more secure, less avoidant, less anxious. Uh, somebody, a secure person can be like a grounding or an orienting reference point for an insecure person to rebuild secure relating behaviors over time. So if you feel like you identified with one of the insecure people, you're not, uh, you're not stuck there. But this whole concept of model goes beyond just these relationship behaviors, but into the very essence of how we see the world. Like many of us don't realize that we're ongoingly sort of pushed towards certain ways of prioritizing our 
our behavior, like prioritizing ourselves, our goals, orienting ourselves in the world, in social groups, in work, in uh, in politics, or whatever. And all of these things are being maybe not dictated, but primarily influenced by the established models that we have, which is of course familial, but it's also cultural, it's civilizational, and it um, it isn't necessarily the way things are. Now. This is kind of going to get back into psilocybin in a second, and I'm seeing the time here. So two other things I mentioned about psilocybin, about the, what was it, there's the feeling the feelings that we don't feel, and then also feeling, yeah, yeah, the pent-up grief and stuff. Okay, so chances are if we are stuck in some sort of dysfunctional relating pattern we're stuck in some sort of dysfunctional relating pattern because we had dysfunctional relationships as children or at some point in our lives which means we're wounded we're carrying around heartbreak um, and we're carrying around heartbreak from the fact that mommy didn't love us or daddy never hugged us or whatever it might be but there was violations at some point in the in the relationship, in the in the expectations your nervous system came into this world with, which looked something like unconditional parental love, nourishing and supporting and guiding the ongoing flourishing and development and expression of your unique essence on this planet as your higher cognitive functions turned on, as your brain developed. And it expected that in the places that it didn't get that, it had to adapt, it had to change itself, it had to basically protect from the reality of the fact that you won't be loved for being you, which might come along with stories like I'm not good enough, or I'm worthless, or I will be abandoned, or it's hopeless, um, it's, uh, what else, hopeless, helpless, alone, um, bad, I am bad, these types of things. These types of stories will start to infuse the models that we have that we're carrying around. And in those places where we're wounded, the model is very tight. Like it's very tight in the sense that it's like the thing that it's protecting is there and the, res the interpretation response is very tight. There's no room for change in the sense that it's like if something comes up, I don't get a lot of time to really feel into, am I really going to be abandoned or is this just like a thing? I'm not sure. It's just like 100% I'm going to be abandoned. And the nervous system responds in that sense. And if we don't have certain levels of self-awareness around that being you know, uh, a memory coming up into the present life without any explicit place and time just arising as an affect and dictating how we see the world, we might respond to it as though it were true. And so all the places where we're wounded, the models are tight. And they're tight for, they're tight because we need to, we need to protect ourselves from the pain that's in there. Because that pain at the time that we received it was unbearable. Because at this point, it's like, okay, many of you in this room, you just imagine how agitating it is when your parents do that thing you know the thing that I'm talking about? They do that thing and it really fucking pisses you off. You're like, ugh, because they've been doing that thing their, your whole life. And if you go back far enough, you realize at some point when they did that thing, it was when you were really, really little and it was a profound violation of, the, of that expectation you came into the world with. And now it's an agitation, but at some point it was a heartbreak. And when a child, an infant is not, or like an infant, a small child is not getting love, it's not just like, oh shit, I'm not getting love. Oh well, I better, you know, work towards it. It is a primal fear. It is like a primal panic that arises in the infant's nervous system because it is so essential that we have love because love is the essential nutrient to our survival. It means that our parents will continue to deal with our bullshit because when we're kids, we have no impulse control. We're just acting out all the time. Um, but it means that they effort towards our survival by feeding us, by housing us, and, and caring for us as we need it. I mean, like, it really takes a certain level of, like, I don't know, like, almost delusional love to be like, yeah, I'll wipe that being's ass every day, multiple times a day. I'll get its vomit on my face. That's no problem. You know, so, like, kids, kids need these, they, they need that love. The nervous system knows. And when the nervous system doesn't get it, it's a primal panic. And there's like a, that primal panic is what sticks around when we get older. Although we're far enough away from it, in some sense, we've learned how to dissociate from that primal panic or adapt to it enough so that it's just like, 
we react with anger or we react with ev ev evasion or whatever way that we react to it, when it starts to come up, we don't feel it to its fullest because we're guarded from it. Our, 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 our immediate reaction, the model tightness, the immediate reaction protects us from having to feel any of it. And it could be extreme or it could be minor. It could be ADHD or it could be binge drinking, you know, so it's like it could be extreme or it could be minor. But ultimately, it's a way in which we're protecting ourselves from feelings that we just can't bear to feel, except it's on an unconscious level. Um, now, when it gets into psilocybin here, uh, and I'm probably going to start asking questions in about 10 minutes, depending on how things go, so I hope you've been hanging out with some ideas. When we take psilocybin, depending on the context, what ends up happening is the, like I had said before about the, the ego mind start to dissolve away. So the defensive mechanisms that usually keep you as in, reacting and interpreting in a particular way, like softens, and all of a sudden there's this spaciousness to experience things differently. Anything from being able to uh, experience music at more depth, to experience movement in your body in a different way, to experience better sex, to experience um, laughter maybe for the first time and who knows how long, but also to experience things that have been hanging around for a long time that you haven't chosen or haven't been able to recognize are hanging around inside of you. So all the pent up, um, all the pent up heartbreak, all the pent up aloneness, all the pent up worthlessness, all the pent up um, I am bad. All of those things can come to the surface because the normal ego mechanisms that sort of contain them into that contain them deep inside of your mind with that very tight reaction space so you never have to feel them kind of go away and they can come to the surface. And when they come to the surface with a psilocybin experience, it can be very difficult because it's not as though, I mean, just experiencing it once, just the primal pain, the primal panic of, you know, that memory of being a child and, and all of a sudden dad snaps and yells in your face, which by the way, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this. How does it feel when I do that? Not very good. I'm an adult, you're an adult, how do you think a five-year-old feels? That's a very difficult thing, and they're looking up at their parent, you know? So the first time we feel that there's that primal panic, that can be, that can be painful, but also according to guys like uh, Stanislav Grof, the structure of our subconscious mind organizes our feelings around sort of central themes, and so if at our core we have this experience where, the, where our father yelled at us because we didn't put his tools away, and we realized that that meant we were worthless, for example, we're not good enough, then now every experience throughout the course of your entire life where you felt worthless or not good enough is all tied up in this constellation that circles around this core experience. And when we open up into a psilocybin process where that stuff comes to the surface, it's not just going to be the memory, it's going to be the cumulative emotional charge, potentially, of all of the times that we felt that way all at once. And one of the other things psilocybin does is it creates unconstrained thinking. So it won't just be remembering one memory, it might be remembering all these memories simultaneously, maybe even manifesting as some sort of metaphorical play in the mind, maybe something with eagles or planets or something. And But the feeling state is still there and we have an opportunity to feel those things and really get those things out to discharge those pent up feelings. Now. This can be extremely distressing, but at the same time, what ends up happening, especially with psilocybin, which tends to also give this profound sense of being connected to something greater or deeper or beyond, something's watching you, something's witnessing you, and I believe that it's the intelligence of the mushrooms, and I don't mean this in a cognocentric kind of way, but some sort of intelligence something that's contained in this organism that has evolved alongside us um, on this planet that we are a part of, an expression of, seems to also carry some sort of a quality of compassion, care, well, compassion and care infused, and like post-judgment, which is to say that recognizes judgment is there, but also transcends it and says no judgment is necessary rather than no judgment at all. And we're able to go into a space where we can re-experience our pain, our wounds, our leftover heartbreak, and we can do so in a way where we really get it out. In, in, in decomposing the shadow, I call it emotive psychosynthesis, 
where what we end up doing is getting out these repressed and dissociated and old emotions like they were food that got stuck somewhere in our bowels and was just rotting in there, fucking up our digestion. And the act of feeling them starts to break them apart and we metabolize them through the act of feeling, often through the act of crying or shaking or screaming or whatever it might be. And then inside of a context where the psilocybin allows us to feel connected to something greater that's infused with compassion and care, we get an opportunity to not only let those feelings out of our body, but to reconsolidate the memories of those wounds with a different quality of care now from the psilocybin, which is that it's okay, you're loved. Now after an experience such as that, we have a greater spaciousness that reaction, that sort of perception reaction tightness goes away a little bit because the what was the, the pressure cooker that was trying to hold it in or that was holding it in has now sort of vented. And we have an opportunity then to, to interpret the world differently, to really engage like, oh, maybe, maybe she's not going to leave me. Maybe she's not answering her phone because it died or something, you know, like the, the battery's flat. It's not that she's with some other man or whatever it is that our, our concerns might be. And that there's a window after a psilocybin experience where we can have that spaciousness that's offered to us and this opportunity to think about things differently and really effort to apply that into our lives. And then over time, we can reshape our nervous system to, to interpret the world differently. We start to recognize, especially if you've taken a lot of mushrooms over a long period of time, maybe the psychedelic savvy people in the room know this, that although there's, a, there's some level of what feels concrete to some degree in a baseline state, there's really a lot of opportunity to change the way you see the world. Like there's a lot of opportunity to recognize that what I think it is almost definitely is not what it is. At the very least, it's not the only thing it can be. And psilocybin can offer that, that to us in regards to um, these old childhood wounds so that we can show up differently in our relationships. Um, now there's a lot to maybe talk there about context and integration and safety protocols and um, there's just like a lot to unpack there obviously. I'm really kind of like swiping the top end of this um, and maybe there's some specific stuff that everyone needs to hear about by you asking the question afterwards. Um, but I'll move on a little bit. So we have that opportunity. Additionally, we have opportunities to feel things that maybe we didn't know were possible to feel. Things like the whole universe loves us. The th things like being another person. Like as in, it's not just like me and you now, it's just, it's just I am and I see you and you are pure love because I am pure love and we're in this together. That's an experience that once you have, assuming that you don't live in a culture that is condition you to see such things as nothing more than trivial, um, you know, trivial drug experiences, that's something that can fundamentally change you as a person. Like the understanding that we're all one woven moving body through the planet, all of us as people together, like that's something that comes up and once it's there, it doesn't leave, not really. Like the idea that, that me and nature are the same, what's the research says something like, it, it shifts the self-construal towards the recognition of oneness with the natural world, something along those lines. Those are experiences we might never have known. I mean, how many of you were raised in a situation where you're given an opportunity to be in pure ecstasy insofar as the love of God streaming through you in ritual and in community? Raise your hand. Really? That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Church, church can be a great place for, especially as children, before you understand the problematic, uh, the problematic politics that are present inside the church amongst the adults and amongst like whatever role that church plays yeah, in the larger world. I remember like, the joy of like singing together, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. having rituals, knowing what to say, as well. without thinking about the political mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. And these things, these can, if you've never yeah. felt that, you might have no idea why that is so valuable. And it, it's an extremely valuable experience, but then when we experience it with something like psilocybin, it carries force and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, there's that, there's that hilarious meme, which is like, oh, you know, you're gonna go from being an entrepreneur in, uh, you know, whatever, Covent Gardens, 
I see some people dressing real nice in this area, you know, and all of a sudden you're going to look like me. You know, that's the thing. <laughs> Lots of times people say, like, if I take psychedelics, will I look like you? And the first thing I say is, like, no, but you might stop judging others. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, but there, is that, there is that meme, and I think in some sense it's because when you look at, say, Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary becoming, well, still Timothy Leary and Baba Ramdas, yeah, you see very straight-laced people, and then you see them become someone different. It's not that the psychedelics confused them. It's that the psychedelics said, hey, there's this experience that's available in life. It's called profound connection with others on a basis of love on a basis of not being stuck into the narrative of ultimately being some sort of like cog in a larger machine working towards apparently extinction, um, but working towards something that has nothing to fucking do with you in the end, ultimately. That there's something else and it's right here and it's right now and it's available to you and all you have to do is change your mind about how you prioritize yourself. So having an experience like that can fundamentally change you. And as a as a, as, as a consequence, maybe change you towards saying, wow, it's really important to me that I spend more time with my friends. You know, I like talk about all this intense stuff that can happen with psilocybin, but, you know, maybe the, when I talked to Breaking Convention, I, I, I said something about the difference between a lesson and learning, and that psilocybin, I mentioned this attunement thing and compassion and blah, 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 but one of the things I pointed at was that you get these experiences that can be lessons and you can learn in your life and some of them are really profound like everything's going to be okay this profound like sense of like there's a there's like a cosmic safety net i've had something like this with ketamine where i was like afraid of dying and then all of a sudden it was just like it doesn't matter what you do or how you do it or how good a job you do or don't do life will carry me all or life will carry me life will carry you all the way to death. It'll be holding and swaddling you the whole way. So something like that changes a person. Uh, anyway, so it, cha it changed me. It, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't make. It didn't make. It didn't make the reality of my dying any easier because the more I recognize that I'm going to die, the more I begin to love this opportunity of being alive, and the more I love my life, the more heartbreak there's going to be when I have to ultimately say goodbye to it. Um, but anyway, so there could be something like that insofar as a lesson. There could be something like, um, I am worthy, I am loved. Those are pretty profound lessons. But it could be something else like, my partner feels cared for when I do the dishes. Simple lessons. Other lessons like, it, I feel healthier when I exercise at least three times a week. Or when, if anyone's ever been on mushrooms and decided to eat like a slice of pizza or potato chips, and it's like, I don't feel good right now. <laughs> you know, or try to watch TV and it's like, this isn't doing anything for me. Um, anyways, I kind of went, went off there. But when I'm, when I'm talking about with the dishes, it's like, there's something there. And it's not like the lesson isn't, I should do the dishes. No, although that's obviously a, an actionable part of the integration process. The lesson is, the quality of this relationship is important to me, and I find value in ensuring that my partner feels cared for by my actions. That's a profound lesson. And once that lands for you, and oftentimes stuff like that, when it lands, it usually lands with some sort of deep grieving process around all the times that you didn't express care because you didn't feel care. And it all sort of that unconstrained thinking gives you this massive load of um, almost synesthesia, could be synesthesia, but insofar as synesthesia were memories, all memories blending up together along with a feeling state and a revelation like, I should do the dishes, I want to do the dishes um, for my lover or whatever. Um, it can change the way we prioritize how we behave in relationships and often, often if we choose to work with it in this way, seeing it as a profound teacher, a profound uh, agent of healing, um, it pushes us towards greater prioritization of the quality of our relationships so that there can be a greater capacity to be together with each other in love. And I think that's something that's really beautiful that the psilocybin can offer us. And I think that's where I'll move towards questions. So yeah, cheers. Thanks. Thanks.
very much, James. That was, that was really interesting. So James coming to our summer festival to actually run two workshops. So we're going to get a chance to actually experience some stuff with him. One is around dance workshops. Dance workshops, partner dance as a container for self-discovery. And the other one, do you remember the title for the other one? No, but it was really nerdy and it had to do with interpersonal neurobiology. And we'll do some activities that are very interesting. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be great. So um, do come and uh, ask any questions about that that you like. Thanks very much.